Be sure to follow my ministry on BitChute and Rumble because this channel could disappear any day. Also, if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube backup channel. Links are in the description box and in my pinned comment below. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. Welcome to the Watchman channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Some say there's a war brewing against conservative media, while others argue it's just another example of Democrats trying to censor viewpoints or political speech they don't like or agree with. On Wednesday, the Democrat-led House Energy and Commerce Committee held a virtual hearing on, quote, disinformation and extremism in the media. When truth becomes a commodity to be traded upon for profit and facts and consequences don't matter to those who report them, our democracy is undermined. Before the hearing, Democrat representatives Jerry McNerney and Anna Escher of California wrote letters to TV providers, including Comcast, AT&T, Cox and Verizon, demanding to know how they plan to stop what they called the spread of dangerous misinformation from right-leaning news outlets like Newsmax, One America News Network and Fox News. Let me put it bluntly. Uh, misinformation is killing Americans and damaging our democracy. Democrats accuse the outlets of being a destabilizing threat to the country and functioning as rumor mills and conspiracy theory hotbeds with their coverage of the presidential election and the global pandemic. Republicans on the committee pushed back, calling the hearing an attack on the First Amendment. Elected officials using their platform to pressure private companies to censure media outlets they disagree with? That sounds like actions from the Chinese Communist Party, not duly elected representatives of the United States Congress. In their letter, Eshu and McNerney asked the TV providers to give their moral reasoning for allowing tens of millions to watch Fox News and other networks. They also asked if they'll continue hosting them, and if so, why? Jonathan Turley, professor at George Washington University Law School, was among those called to testify. From the perspectives of free speech and the free press, the letter is not just chilling, it's positively glacial. Dr. Frank Wright of D. James Kennedy Ministries knows what it's like to be on the receiving end of censorship. Earlier this month, the ministry's weekly Christian program was forced off Lifetime TV after it aired, among other things, a pro-life special. The ultimatum we received was basically, your programming going forward must have all non-controversial topics in order to continue to air on our network. You know, if you're a biblical Christian these days, there's not much in the culture that's not considered controversial. And their censorship is happening online as well with big tech companies. This past Sunday, Dr. Ryan Anderson's book, which challenges progressive ideas about gender, was pulled from Amazon's cyber shelves. We're going to have to think through how we as conservatives approach both the governmental side and the big business side, because both of them seem to be hostile to people with traditional American values. The House Energy and Commerce Committee will hear next month from the CEOs of Twitter, Facebook, and Google. The story everybody's talking about this morning, that big rebrand of Mr. Potato Head, the classic children's toy now has a gender neutral name. And this morning, as you can imagine, the reaction is pouring in. Deborah Roberts joins us now with more on this. Good morning, Deb. Good morning, Cecilia. Hasbro is joining a list of companies that are now rebranding products in an effort to be more inclusive. But when it comes to beloved toys, it doesn't always go over so well with the public. While some are applauding these efforts to make Mr. Potato Head more welcoming, others see it as overkill in an age of political correctness. I need you. He's been a regular on the toy shelf for nearly 70 years. Back in the 50s, families had to supply their own potato. Okay, fellas, let's roll. Later, he and Mrs. Potato Head had audiences lapping their pants off in our parent company Disney's Toy Story movies. 
Mr. and Mrs. You gotta keep them together because they're madly in love. But sprouting up this fall, get ready for simply Potato Head, the Hasbro company rebranding with a gender neutral name, set to release a create your own Potato Head family set. That'll include two large potato bodies, a small child potato, and 42 different accessories, which will allow children to mix and match and create the family structure they want. We will always have our fantastic Mr. Potato Head from 1952, and it was a great, great toy. But right now, looking forward, this is a fantastic option for a more diverse community of children and a more diverse society. The change following similar moves with other brands, like Barbie, now coming in a range of skin tones and body types. As for Hasbro, the company taking pains to assure Potato Head fans that the product isn't completely changing. Mr. and Mrs. Potato Head aren't going anywhere. Now you can imagine that this rebranding set off a lot of heated exchanges on social media. Many, much of it political. Many people saying this is all about cancel culture. Others having fun with potato, potato. But clearly the Hasbro company trying to walk a line here and so far not affected. Its stock seems to be holding just fine. What does the Bible say about political correctness? And should a Christian be politically correct? Political correctness is defined as a term that describes language, ideas, policies, and behaviors seen as seeking to minimize social and institutional offense in occupational, gender, racial, cultural, sexual orientation, religious belief, disability, and age-related contexts. The key word here is offense. Certainly as Christians, we are not to go out of our way to offend anyone personally, but the truth is, the Christianity itself is offensive, as we read in 2 Peter 2, 7 and 8. 1 Peter 2, 7 and 8. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. As Christians, we need to be diligent and not get caught up in the emotionally charged responses of today's PC culture. We need to chuck our emotions out the window, no matter how hard that may be, and obey God rather than man, as we read in Acts 5.29. But Peter and the apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Equally offensive is the necessity of dying to oneself in order to follow Christ. Of all the religions of the world today, Christianity is the only one that tells you to follow Jesus and die to oneself, as we read in Matthew 16.24. In Galatians 5.24 Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Those who hear this message know exactly what Jesus means. To follow him is to die to self and give up everything we hold dear. Political correctness in the secular political realm is not the concern of Christians as our citizenship is in heaven, as we read in Philippians 3.20 20 and 21. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Cancel culture strikes again, especially on college campuses, where you can no longer refer to a woman nursing her baby as breastfeeding. You can't make this stuff up, folks, ignoring the science. Some academics are insisting that by using the term breastfeeding, people are endorsing, quote, a controversial set of values about family life and gender roles. We'll hear with more from the University of Florida's campus reform reporter, Ophelia Jacobson. Ophelia, I'm assuming you're not shocked or surprised by this, so set us straight. We're now politically incorrect if we're referring to nursing a baby as breastfeeding. Explain what's happening. That's exactly right. According to two professors at the University of Pennsylvania and John Hopkins University, who wrote an article in a medical journal back in 2016, the term breastfeeding, like you said, can present a controversial set of values for family life and gender roles. And I am not surprised. This is nothing new at the Leadership Institute's campus reform. We've been covering how basic biological facts have been attacked by higher education institutions for years. A couple of months ago, 
who reported on a group of medical professionals at Harvard University who referred to women as birthing people on Twitter because according to the so-called experts, not all those who give birth are women. This is absurd. And, you know, a couple of university hospitals in the, in the United Kingdom are starting to replace the word breastfeeding with chest feeding. So we're seeing this ideology take place overseas, and we're going to see it soon come into our college classrooms in this nation. Well, last time I checked, only women can actually breastfeed. Men can't do that. I understand this movement to remove gender roles, as you mentioned, started in the U.K. What else do they do, and how has it spread? Well, again, what we're seeing, it's not only an attack on the basics, basic essence of womanhood, it's an attack on basic biological facts. It's basic science that a woman is her, you know, her body is built in a unique way to give birth and to nurture that life. And speaking of science, you know, I find it ironic how the left is consistently pushing for people to follow the science and to look at the facts, especially with the coronavirus pandemic. But it seems as if they are the first people to throw out science when it comes to being all inclusive and non-offensive. You know, it's a unique ability that it's a God given ability that women are able to give birth and to nurture that life. But according to the left, it's now a curse. It just shows just how radical their agenda is becoming that now it's unfair that only women can give birth and only women can nurture that life through breastfeeding. Ophelia, how should women respond? How should they react to this? Well, I think they should be offended. I, for one, I know that I am offended because it seems as if the left is trying to take away every single thing that makes me unique as a woman, which, again, is the ability to give birth and to nurture that life. You know, science shows that men and women are built in very different ways and have very different and unique roles in this life. So society should be encouraging both men and women to embrace their anatomy and to embrace their biology for what God gave them and to use it, you know, and for women, that's to give birth and to nurture that life. Traditional family is under attack like no other time in history. God instituted marriage between one man and one woman and is very holy to him. Why is marriage between a man and a woman so sacred to God? Genesis 2, 23 and 24. And Adam said, This is now a bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Ephesians 5, 31 through 33. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. By mystery, Paul means the hidden plan of God that has come to fulfillment in Christ Jesus, as we read in Ephesians 3, 9, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ. Thus, the Apostle Paul's quotation about marriage from Genesis 2 and Ephesians 5.31 ties into the relationship between Christ and his church. Paul's meaning is profound. He interprets the original creation of the husband and wife union as itself modeled on Christ's forthcoming union with the church as his body, as we read in Ephesians 5.23. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, marriage from the beginning of creation in Genesis 1 was created by God to be a reflection of and patterned after Christ's relation to the church. Thus, Paul's commands regarding the roles of husbands and wives do not merely reflect the culture of his day, but also the present. God's ideal for all marriages at all times as exemplified by the relationship between the bride of Christ, the church, and Christ himself, the son of God. The biblical concept of marriage is a oneness between two individuals that pictures the oneness of Christ with his church. Satan is busy in these last days, destroying marriage in every way possible. He got a foothold when gay marriage was legalized and now anything goes. Satan hates marriage and in particular he hates Christian marriages because believers display the gospel and glorify God in their marriage. Satan thus aims to destroy Christian marriages because such opposition hinders the witness of Christ to the world. 1 Peter 5.8 Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. 
Six Dr. Seuss books will no longer be published because of what's described as racist and insensitive imagery. The business group that protects Dr. Seuss's legacy says that move is to make sure his catalog represents and supports all communities and families. Almost four years ago on this show, we talked to a former Georgia state representative called LaDawn Jones about Black Lives Matter. Jones is a strong supporter of BLM, so not surprisingly, she was well-practiced in the now highly familiar tactic of denouncing everything she doesn't like as racist, and we knew that going into the interview. What was surprising was to hear LaDawn Jones go after the beloved children's book author, Dr. Seuss. She called Dr. Seuss a bigot. Here's the exchange from 2017. I actually had to, once I heard the story, pull out our Dr. Seuss books that are on my children's bookshelf and take a closer look at them so I can see exactly what it was that was the complaint. And as is normal well, what was for it? many what, of us. What, what was it? I mean, actually, I've been obviously speaking tongue in cheek because this is like literally demented. But since you said that you checked Dr. Seuss for racism, what did you find? Where were the racist parts? So you look at many of the drawings and you have to put it in the context of the times that many of these books were, were written. And you can see that there are some very stereotypical drawings of Asian Americans. Um, Dr. Seuss was known for some very stereotypical blackface drawings prior to the books that most of us are familiar with. Now at the time, what you just heard seemed incomprehensible. In fact, as we noted, kind of demented. Say what you will about Dr. Seuss. Maybe you think his drawings are primitive. Maybe some of his dog rule doesn't actually rhyme. Fair. But Dr. Seuss was not a racist. Dr. Seuss was a preachy liberal. He was an evangelist against bigotry. He wrote an entire shelf of books against racism and not in a subtle way. They were clearly, explicitly against racism. That was the whole point of writing them, to teach children not to be racist. Now, as it happens, today is Dr. Seuss's birthday. Born Ted Geisel in Springfield, Massachusetts, he would be 117 years old were he alive today. And thank God he isn't, because he would be wounded and confused. Every year on Dr. Seuss's birthday, the president, whomever he is at the time, makes a proclamation in support of something called Read Across America Day. That's designed to encourage kids to read books. And every year, the president mentions Dr. Seuss, because, again, it's his birthday. That's the whole point of it. But not this year. Joe Biden omitted Dr. Seuss from this year's proclamation. Why? because Dr. Seuss is now considered a racist. So what seemed like total lunacy less than four years ago is now the official position of the White House. Now, the shocking thing about this is not that it happened. Academic revolutionaries have been attacking traditional children's books for decades. A few years ago, some moron at Boston University produced so-called research on Curious George's undercurrent of white dominance, quote, the series celebration of the oppression of an abducted monkey parallels the oppression of black Americans. What's surprising is how calculated all this is. Now, conservatives will be tempted to chalk up the attacks on Dr. Seuss to the usual cancel culture gone mad. Look how hysterical and stupid the professional left is. They're even calling Dr. Seuss racist. And you've seen people say that on social media today. But it's totally missing the point. Canceling Dr. Seuss isn't stupid, it's intentional. They're banning Dr. Seuss not because he was a racist, but precisely because he wasn't. In 1961, Dr. Seuss wrote a story called The Sneetches. Martin Luther King's March on Washington was still two years away, but Dr. Seuss's story captured its essence. In case you haven't already read it to your kids 50 times and know it by heart, here's the plot. There's a group of furry pear-shaped animals called Sneetches who live on what looks like a faraway planet. Now, if that sounds weird to you, be aware that Dr. Seuss rarely drew people, probably because he didn't want to elevate one kind of person over any other kind of person. He wasn't a racist. In any case, there are two groups of Sneetches in the story, those with star-shaped designs on their stomachs and those without. There's no real difference between the two groups, but the Sneetches don't know that. They're convinced that stars are all important. So they spend the entire story jockeying for position based on the relative starness. At various points in the story, stars on the stomach are deemed socially favorable. At others, they're considered a mark of disgrace. And the Sneetches run around frantically trying to keep up with the changing demands of star fashion until they realize in the uplifting final pages of the story that none of it matters. Underneath the stars, they're all the same. They're all Sneetches. Who cares who's got a star? What matters isn't the group you come from. What matters is you. Even a five-year-old gets the point of the story. 
at the deepest level, it doesn't matter what we look like because underneath it all, we're all the same. We're all human beings. We're in this together. All that outward appearance stuff is pointless. It just makes people hate each other and it makes us look ridiculous. If there's a more powerful statement on the universal brotherhood of man, it's probably not in the children's section of the bookstore. For 60 years, American children have read the Sneetches and books like it. And that's one of the reasons we have the country we have today, in which most Americans, those who don't work at the universities or for the Joe Biden administration, accept Martin Luther King's most famous precept, that what matters is the content of our characters, not the color of our skins. The Sneetches affirm this. The story is a plea for colorblindness. And that's why the forces of wokeness hate it and Dr. Seuss. When the people in charge cancel Dr. Seuss, what they're really trying to eliminate is a very specific kind of mid-century American culture, a culture that championed meritocracy and colorblindness and the superiority of individual achievement over tribal identity. These were once called liberal values. Modern liberals don't want to be reminded that they once believed any of this. If your kids are allowed to read Dr. Seuss, they will know this was a different country not so long ago, a place where people tried hard not to hate each other, a place where the population was encouraged, begged by its leaders to reject identity politics in favor of universal values and the things that connect us all. Dr. Seuss was never a major literary figure, but his memory matters more than it ever has. The battle over Dr. Seuss, what he stood for, the battle over what it means to be racist, will have consequences that extend for generations. And if we lose that battle, America is lost. The Bible teaches us not to follow after philosophers and deceivers of the world. As we read in Colossians 2.8, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. As we watch world events unfold, it is as if we are all watching the same movie. Yet at the same time, Christians and unbelievers are seeing two separate stories. Christians are watching world events unfold, just as the Bible said it would, right before Jesus returns. Christians long for Christ's return, as we are looking forward to the day He rules and reigns as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We look forward to a day when there will be no more lawlessness, a time of peace and harmony with all creation. Unbelievers, on the other hand, are trying to create their own utopian society, where lawlessness runs unchecked and every kind of evil is thought to be good. Christians have been given the Spirit of God as a gift, as we read in 1 Corinthians 2, 12 through 16. Now we have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God, these things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man, speaking of the unsaved, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. Paul goes on to say this in Galatians 6, 7, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. The unsaved are doing the desires of their father the devil, as we read in John 8, 44. You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. The reality at the end of these two stories also have different outcomes. The prophet Daniel put it succinctly, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Which do you choose, everlasting life or shame and everlasting contempt? It's up to you, eternity with God or eternity in the lake of fire. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, 
apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. John 15, 18-20 If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Well, in Nigeria, the parliament has issued an urgent appeal to the Nigerian president to rescue a Christian pastor ahead of his possible execution. Islamic terrorists are threatening to kill Pastor Bolas Yakura on Thursday if their ransom demands are not met. They kidnapped him in December and they've released a video of Yakura announcing his execution on March the 4th. Well, meanwhile, 279 Nigerian girls are back with their families after being kidnapped by dozens of armed men. The girls were abducted from a boarding school four days ago. It was the third mass abduction in Nigeria's northwest in recent months. Well, CBN senior international correspondent George Thomas joins us now to discuss the plight of the pastor and our other top international stories. George, a lot going on here. Yeah. Um, the Muslim kidnappers are threatening to kill this pastor on Thursday. Uh, do we think this will happen? What's the latest here? Yeah, I mean, it's uncertain. I mean, everybody's holding their breath all across Nigeria. People are praying in the next 48 hours. Uh, the Islamic terrorists, they don't, you know, they don't want to, uh, you know, some, uh, ultimately what they want is that they want the government to pony up some money, hoping the Christian community will ban together. There's no uh, indication that that is happening right now and all efforts are in the next 48 hours to try and get this released, get this pastor released. Uh, Nigeria's uh, parliament, as you mentioned, made an urgent plea to the government uh, and obviously this pastor has taken sort of the prominence uh, in the last uh, few weeks uh, drawing attention uh, to his plight. Mm, so gripping. Uh, and we know that for more than a decade, Boko Haram and other Islamic groups have, have really, they've launched terror across the country yeah. and we know that this kidnap for ransom scheme seems to be a, a new trend is this what's the advantage for them yeah I mean the, you know let's not be um, a, a fool here they continue to kill people continue to uh, launch terror attacks but clearly they've discovered in the last 12 14 months that this tactic as you saw 279 girls kidnapped uh, you know the tactic is let's grab these girls let's grab these Christians and hopefully the government responds the Christian community response. So far, it is working. It apparently is working, and it's a cash cow uh, for them. And obviously, there's a lot of uh, criticism against the Nigerian government that they're allowing this to happen. But in these parts, like, for example, in the northeast part of Nigeria, you know, they don't have police officers. They, they don't have a, a presence of the, of the military. So these these boarding schools, primarily with, you know, girls and boys, uh, are easy targets. And uh, right now they're reaping a lot of money from this particular scheme. All right. And I just want to circle back on sure. one thing. We were talking about the parliament appealing to the president. Yeah. Does the president really hold sway with these Islamic terrorist groups? Well, the problem is that uh, Muhammad Buhari is uh, from the largest uh, Muslim ethnic group. He is part of the Fulani uh, ethnic group. And the criticism that human rights groups as well as Christians have made against uh, President Buhari is that he uh, basically is tone deaf to the plight of Christians, plight of these girls, that he really is not doing anything because he is a Muslim and that's the concern that's been the criticism remember to pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ remember the prisoners as if chained with them those who are mistreated since you yourselves are in the body also Hebrews 13 3 1 Corinthians 12 26 and if one member suffers all the members suffer with it or if one member is honored all the members rejoice with it Matthew 5 10 through 12 blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you, and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecute the prophets who were before you. 1 Corinthians 16.13 Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. 
one day Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates His own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with Him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in Him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance but it is one of the results of genuine, faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.